is the physical geography presentation of the tsunami. So, I'm going to focus on this part here, which is North Sumatra in Indonesia, because it's the region where we had the largest amount of death out of the tsunami, meaning about 150,000 people who just died within minutes. As you can see, Banda Aceh, the main city of North Sumatra, located in North Sumatra, yeah, um, is located at the far end of a series of fault lines that are crossing the Barisan, Barisan, B-A-R-I-S-A-N, Barisan meaning, meaning being the name of this mountain change, mountain range that cross Sumatra Island. And that's where I'm going to focus for physical, and you're going to see later, social reasons as well. So what happened in Banda Aceh? Here you have a map of the level of devastation, destruction, the city being located all of here, all here, from totally flattened area to highly affect affected to only areas that have been actually flooded. And when you look at the scale of the map, you can see that the water came inland more than two kilometers to reach area far end from the coast. When you look at the distribution of destruction and inundation, what can you see? Is there any special pattern that you can recognize? If you have seen the image from what happened in Japan, it's very similar. The tsunami flow, the tsunami waves have followed some highway for the tsunami that are what? Do you reckon? Yeah, rivers, exactly. When you look here at the flow coming inland, it's following the river. And right on this side as well, and here you have also a small river that comes here. And this favor the advance of the tsunami inland. Why is that so? Because the tsunami can move easier and faster over water, so being there's already water in the river, it can just help travel up it. Yeah, it help, um, exactly. It exactly. And why, when we have more water, did you hear what you said? More water, it travels faster. Why is that so? Less friction. Yeah, less friction. Not everyone but you from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's correct. That's exactly the, the problem. It's exactly like, you know, um, if you take honey, you try to like flow it on a plate, it's also very viscous. And when the tsunami water is incorporating debris, it's getting more and more viscous. All right? But when you take the waterways, you have more water coming in, and if we slow, your honey is exactly the same. If you <coughs> mix your honey with hot water, it's going to flow very, like, way faster, way better. We agree? It's about the same process on top of all the boundary layers problem that you can have. So for this lesson, I mean the coming lessons at least, the first part we're going to see, and that's going to be today's lesson, are the environmental triggers of the catastrophe. The human side, <coughs> that will be I guess next week. And the environmental consequences. And during the human side of the catastrophe, I will talk about all the humanitarian actions, the fails actions, and all the problems that come with it. So, environmental causes, an exceptional tsunami. And before telling you why it's exceptional, I'm going to tell you why it's not exceptional. Well, first by its frequency. <coughs> when you look 
at the number of large tsunami that swept Indonesian coast, you can see from like the end of the 19th century, it's quite a lot. And it's quite kind of regular in some ways. And most probably, we don't have all the data for it. I remember like um, three, four, maybe more, I'm getting old now, five, years, six years ago, I was on Sumatra Island in the forest. And it's, it's really more like more or less the jungle at some part where, where the forest le uh, remains. And there was this old woman who just, a local one, and she like just saw us and she was like, wow, the, the guys from Holland are coming back, knowing that Indonesia was colonized until the, like, the 20th century like by Holland people. And she just to tell you that she just saw that we scientists were coming, like military people coming from Holland, going to, going to try to get back Indonesia. And that gives you some idea of like how disconnected some of them are. Because there is no TV, no radio, and some communities really live on their own. All right? To tell you that well, for those communities, even if they have been affected by tsunami 19th century, early 20th century, there is no way that it makes it up to the archives of, like our archives as scientists. You know what I mean? In the sense like there is no way for us to know if like there have been more tsunami on some islands than what we have here. To get this record, at some point we need to get some white guys, at least for the 19th century, um, down there and um, record all of this. All right? So that this is a minimum, at least, for those data. Despite the idea that we have, and especially maybe after the tsunami this year in Japan, most tsunamis are non-damaging. Then again, why is that so? Why do you think like most tsunamis are not damaging? What can be the reasons? At least two main ones. Areas? Yeah, exactly. A lot of coasts are not populated. Plus... They originate far at sea. Sorry? They originate far at sea. Um, even if they... Yeah, it can be, but even when they originate far at sea, most of the time, like, when they come to and sweep the coast, we're going to see that they tend to become like way bigger. But it can be one of the reasons because if they are like the source is far away, what can happen? Long yeah, exactly. Like a 50 centimeter wave can be a tsunami, even at cost, or 20 centimeter. And when you look at the records again in Japan, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of them. And you have like some um, warning coming on TV, telling you blah, 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 tsunami is coming. And in the end, it's just like, you know, 30 centimeters. You go to the coast and you cannot even see it. So that's the two main reasons. Meaning that tsunami are not any rare event in nature. If you take just like 1990 to 1999, like uh, it's what, 97 tsunamis, quite a lot actually. It's more than one a year. No, 10 a year. Yeah, sorry. 10 a year. So, why is it exceptional? Well, well, by the earthquake that triggered it. <coughs> like for the tsunami this year, in Japan, it's also a magnitude 9, or 9.3 according to different agency, depending who's doing like the calculation. But let's assume that it's a 9. And it was also very close to the coast. And that was the same problem also um, in Japan right now. But when you look at the building on the right, those are actually constructions that are not better than the one in uh, Christchurch CBD. For magnitude 9, well, it's still standing and it's brick. Do you know why? Would you have any... Uh, sorry? Because we're really deep. Um, no, it could be, but wasn't the reason. The frequency of the shake. When you were there, I, you can also see some video on YouTube, I guess. And it was like riding a wave. Like the amplitude was like 
really like low. And on top of this, the frequency was like very, the, the uh, wave was very large. Did you say large for frequency? No. There is another word, I guess. High? High frequency? Like it was low frequency because like the wave was very extended. All right? So when we were there, like the building was, we were really riding the waves. When in Christchurch the other time, it was like, taka 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 taka. can you remember that? You couldn't feel that. We were there at that time, actually, because we went, before the tsunami, about a few weeks ago, we went to the government council and we were like, proposing them like a tsunami uh, disaster management plan, telling them that you are in a dangerous zone, blah, blah, blah. And it happened just after that. That's why like, we have some nice fresh pictures that are just from after the quake. And the building didn't collapse because of this reason. So that you have to be careful even when you're looking on the news, otherwise they are telling you magnitude, blah, 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 whatever. It really depends on a lot of factors, the duration, the, the amplitude of the waves, but also the frequency of the waves. All right? Yeah, so those are some other buildings, which is like really nothing, knowing that those buildings are not built with any anti-seismic rules. And there is like barely some damage for a nine, nine, a nine quake. What's exceptional is the location of the quake. When you look historically at the location of the previous epicenter, they are way more south along the coast. And that's the first time that actually an epicenter happens to be so close to Thailand. And unfortunately, to Bendachi as well. On top of that, we had a lot of large aftershocks. When you look at the key on the left side, you can see that we had a lot of like mining of six to seven aftershocks after the quake, like during a month. And those quakes actually triggered a lot of panic on the coast. After seeing one of the events, people were thinking each time there, are there is an aftershock, there will be a tsunami. And I'll talk about this maybe next week, but the death toll rise because of this, because people were rushing out from the coast, and like they just drove like crazy away from the sea, and there were car crash, people getting killed because of this mass movement, panic movement. All right. By comparison, like any aftershocks which is bigger than this circle here, is way bigger than the like the last earthquake that we had here and that has closed all our building. All right, and it does shake a lot. I can tell you. So what happened on top of the tsunami? This is a bit away from the coast of Banda Aceh, and it's the Simelu Island, S-I-M-E-U-L-U-H Island. And this end, the north end, just rose by 1.5 meter because of the earthquake. How did we notice that? Without any complicated like measurements or anything? The main sea level one? Sorry? The main sea level? Yeah, it's linked to the sea level. When you look at this part here, all of this were coral leaf reef underwater. And just after the tsunami, like going by helicopter, you could see that people actually could walk. Oh, sorry. Yeah. For this coral leaf reef, sorry, to grow, you need at least one meter on top of it, of water constantly. 